I'm going to share with you from the Christian perspective is one that was developed by theologian N.T. Wright. Again, people in the class will remember that name. We studied a book that he co-wrote uh, several years ago. And uh, Dr. Wright or Mr. Wright, I'm not sure what his credentials are, but uh, he suggests that the master was not Jesus, but God himself. And the first two servants represent his disciples, God's disciples. Again, they're being entrusted with something very valuable, with this new understanding about what God was trying to accomplish in the world and how he's trying to elevate them to righteous living, first by giving them the Mosaic law and now with the gift of his son and, and with his church. And these are valuable gifts, more than they would ever be able to learn or ever be able to earn in their lifetimes. And they need to put God's will, uh, goodwill to work by sharing this message with others. The, the third servant represents a tradition that has become stuck and is inward looking and is no longer accomplishing God's purposes. And so in telling this parable, Wright says that Jesus is pointing at the scribes and the Pharisees who were given the law, they were given the temple, they had a covenant with God, they had a promise that God would bless not only Israel, but would have blessed the whole world through them, but they dropped the ball. And rather than generously sharing this great gift, the scribes and the Pharisees buried it in the ground, keeping it for themselves, which was meant to be shared freely with all of the world. And because of that, the parable says, it is they who will be cast into outer darkness. They will be left out of God's plan. So the scribes and the Pharisees are the frightful or the frightened servant. Well, as I mentioned, Amy Jill Levine, who wrote the book about the parables that we've been studying, doesn't deal with this one in her book. But there are a number of scholars who have written about the parable of the talents and what I would call the spirit of the approach that she uses, which is to use Jewish historical context as the basis for trying to understand the parable's message in, in a more literal and a more practical sense. And recently, as scholars have been looking at this parable from this contextual perspective, and there is beginning to be some general agreement that maybe our previous understandings about the story are missing the point of the parable. I don't want to take a long time with this, but I'm going to point out a couple of things from this paradigm. So again, let me just reassure you that if this interpretation disturbs your thinking, you do not have to accept it. But parables are meant to shake us up and to cause us to think in new ways. So I ask that you at least give it a chance. First of all, we have to understand what a talent is worth. You may be aware that one talent is a very large sum of money. It's equal to 20 years wages for a laborer. In, in today's dollars, a talent would be equal to $650,000. Five talents would be $3,250,000. Anyone who was listening to Jesus in the Mount of Olives talk about this parable would immediately think that this is an absolutely absurd amount of money for a master to place in the hands of a mere slave. And even more absurd would be the idea that the slave could double the amount of that money to nearly $7 million in a period of months or perhaps a few years by taking it to the bank and making interest on it. And if you were there sitting next to Peter and James and John, your mind would be filled with questions. Where did this guy, this master, get so much money? And what were they investing in, the slaves, what did they invest in that could gain so much in interest? In that, at, at that time in history, it would be unlikely that so much money could have been made from an honest or a principled business. That's what a first century Jew would think. In fact, in first century Palestine, large sums of money could be made primarily in three ways. Extortion, tax collecting. We've talked about tax collectors and other uh, themes in our worship services and in making high interest loans to small farmers based on their anticipated crop yields. And in the years when the crops failed, the farmers would default on their high interest loans and the land would revert over to the lender who then hired the farmer as a day laborer. And by the way, charging interest to the poor happens to be prohibited by the Mosaic law, both in Exodus and in Leviticus. 
So I'm going to ask you now, was the master really a good person? Look at what the third slave says to him. Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you did not scatter seed. And so I was afraid. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. If we take that scripture at face value, doesn't it sound like the slave is telling him, Master, you make your living by stealing from others. And it makes me fearful because the law forbids it. It is wrong, and this servant feared that being disobedient to God by being compelled to do that which was illegal would, would be uh, bad for him. Presumably, the first two servants who multiplied the master's money by fantastic amounts did so by the same unscrupulous practices that, he had that the master had used. And look now how the master responds to the fearful slave. He's furious with the slave. The master replied, you wicked and lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I don't sow and I gather where I do not scatter. Then you should have invested my money with the bankers and on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. And as for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You didn't make a profit for me. You're worthless, you're fired. And if you're fired from being a slave, there's not a whole lot else that you can do in the world. Your life is pretty much ruined. You go into the outer darkness, shunned from society, probably to be homeless for the rest of your life. And with this kind of a reading, it gets a little bit difficult to see either Jesus or God in the role of the master because he doesn't sound like a good person. His behavior is hateful. From this perspective, the parable is not about the kingdom of God, but it's about the sad reality of the world, where love of money and greed and predatory practices stand in opposition to God's vision of justice for the world. Some scholars have now recently suggested that the parable of the talents may be, well be the most abused text in the New Testament. And some writers are disturbed because misuse of the parable has led to the development of something called prosperity gospel that's preached by a number of TV evangelists. And so I want to finish up by talking about the third servant. Was he really the bad guy if he refused to be part of the master's plan to accumulate more wealth because he was afraid to disobey God? By burying his money, it has been suggested that he was taking the money out of circulation and putting it where it could not be used to exploit and to dispossess others. The slave made dramatic accusations against the master's behavior, and you'll note that the master could refute none of what the slave had said. But his response to hearing the truth is to label the slave as worthless, and to use the power that he wields to cast the slave out and to leave him with nothing. How many times have you heard such stories about an honest person trying to speak truth to power only to be punished for their effort? So is this parable then about money and stewardship or is it about justice in God's world? At this point, I'm gonna leave you to decide which interpretation speaks to you. If you don't like any of the three that I've presented, apparently there are 17 or more that you can explore and decide which one you do like. I still need to speak to the theme of whole life stewardship that Ron mentioned earlier in the service. And based on the contextual way of looking at this parable, I'm going to simply close by saying that whole life stewardship, stewardship may well be more than just being good managers of our money and paying a 10% tithe to the church. It's about managing all of the resources that God has blessed us with. Yes, time, talent, treasures, as we have heard many times during offering sta statements, but also less tangible resources like our integrity, our good word, our credibility, our discernment of what is true and good, our empathy for others, including those we are not close to, as well as we, those that we are our authenticity with each other, and our relationships. We have many resources over which God invites us to be stewards, and our stewardship should be aligned with our understanding of what God's gifts are and with what God's expectations are about how to use those gifts.
all of them. What are the resources that God has invested in you? How can they be used to stand for what is right and good and just? Is it important in a world that struggles to even understand what it means to live justly? The prophet Micah tells us he has shown you, O mortal, what is good, to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. And I would tack on to that the scripture that Ron referred to earlier, to love God and to love our neighbor. So what resources today will you use to commit to building the kingdom?